when you read the work of your, your um, colleagues in the collection, what did you find revealing and new about their archival findings? And how, you know, how did other people's essays in the volume influence your own understanding of Bishop? I mean, as a whole. One of the essays that was really revelatory to me is Claire Seiler's about Elizabeth Bishop's kind of professionalization and her self-presentation um, at a time specifically when poetry was entering the academy and there's all this baggage about kind of whether you're an academic poet or how you situate yourself vis-a-vis -vis academia. In her presentation at the American Literature Association, the way she kind of discusses her work, give herself a kind of persona she thinks will be winning in terms of monetary um, awards is really fascinating. And I, I think it also comes at a time when, you know, maybe poetry had um, a very conflictual relationship with the academies. Maybe it still does, I don't know. But that essay really, for me, um, brought up aspects of Bishop's work and her thinking that I hadn't really reflected on beforehand. Yeah, I remember talking to Claire in the archive and I was like, what are you working on, Claire? And she said something like, I'm looking at all the boring stuff. Like, <laughs> I'm looking at all the paperwork. And then, so in that way, her essay and, and John's to a big extent, extent you know, kind of modeled for me the ways that you shouldn't overlook anything, like no draft, no no documents, no ephemera, no grocery list, um, nothing nothing can, you, you can find something in all of it. Um, so, so I really appreciate the way that um, John's essay kind of opened me up to this entire different, um, different bishop piece and, and things that she was working through, but also the way that, you know, um, he, like Heather's piece gives me a, a brand new way to read um, a beloved bishop classic. So, um, yeah, I respect and admire all of your work in, in so many ways. And uh, thanks for writing it and teaching me things. I was really struck by the essays that dealt with um, the visual things like y y Yael's essay and Doug Basford's essay and, um, and Laura uh, Patterson's essay, you know, that dealt with the, the visual stuff. I was really... I mean, because I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't usually think that way myself. So, they, so they really taught me a lot to look at, look at that kind of stuff. I'm much more of a, of a verbal kind of person. I also um, found it very useful to have read a draft of Heather's essay as I was finishing my essay, and so that kind of helped us, help, help me a lot, especially. But um. I think it helped focus stuff for, for my own writing too. So. Yeah, Richard, um, reading reading drafts of your essay for, was also really, really influential and in, in the reading I was trying to give in the waiting room. And I, I certainly appreciated um, all of the essays really. Um, and for me, as, as someone who's not particularly strong in her knowledge of science, reading Sarah Girgoshin's oh, yeah. uh, chapter on geopoetics and Bishop's relationship with Darwin and, or to Darwin's work. Mm -hmm. And um, her reading of The Mountain, which was a poem I, I have to say I'd always sort of been mystified by. Um, Sarah's reading of that really sort of chiseled it open uh, for me um, in ways that, uh, that have sort of since led me to teach that poem. So I think, I think the variety of, of specializations and backgrounds that each of us had and brought to the archive, um, brought to bear on the archive, um, was for me really kind of invigorating. And it's, it's great to have the book to sort of linger in each of these perspectives and, and grow from them in certain ways. The book itself is a beautiful object, but the uh, open access is a whole lot more useful because of, you know, hypertextual things and, and so forth. So I, I think that's a, a great feature of it. Did you have, Bethany, um, different ways that you were thinking of organizing the essays initially? I was just- uh, Yeah, that's a, yeah, I, I changed a number of times <laughs> as essays came in because, to, you know, I based 
you obviously had abstracts to initially, and then chapters came together and they sort of came together in different ways than people expected. I mean, of course that happens when you write a chapter. Um, and so, so I reorganized it a couple of times. But one of the things that I was really excited about when the book all came together was just how there, there is, I don't think, you know, I've read, I've participated in lots of edited collections of essays and I have edited other collections of essays, but this was the most uh, unified. It's, it's actually very diverse in terms of the kind of material that it covers in the archives, but it's also, uh, it just has this foundation of unity that I think comes out of our excitement of being in the archive and working together so that the essays appear to sort of speak to each other in, in some kind of organic way that you can't necessarily pinpoint exactly how that works, but it just feels like they do. So I, I really, I don't think we could have ever duplicated that in just a conventional edited volume. So that was very exciting when I when I used the with that when I used the collection in class and reread it and and because I'd read it, you know I'd read it so many times but in various iterations but when I read it all the way through again when the final you know with the actual published book I was just so struck by it and my students um, gosh they really loved the essays. I mean, I used a lot of them in the class. William students, they're very, very smart students and they've read a lot of criticism and it was a, a upper level seminar on Bishop and they were, they were blown away by the approaches. They were very excited about the, the critical aspects of this book. They felt like it was new and modern and fresh. I was going to say too, Bethany, I think um, the core set of readings that you put together for us, um, thinking about archival study, um, I think in some ways kind of primed us all to have similar kinds of questions. I think on some level, we were all thinking about, about the work in a kind of uh, meta, meta archival or meta scholarly way that, um, that I had never done before. But I think in a way sort of gave us a unifying set of concerns that might have manifest later in the finished product. Um, I mean, I had, it's so rare, usually when I go to work in an archive, I'm so pressed for time um, that there's, there's hardly enough time to do the work itself, never mind think about, um, spend much time thinking about the, the work and how I'm going about it. It's just getting it done and um, making sure the photocopies are legible before I run home. <laughs> analyze them at home and wonder about, well, why did I have this photocopied again? Just the leisure of having three weeks and, and um, being able to think abstractly about the materiality of what we were handling was also a great gift and really deeply enhanced um, the archival experience and made it um, much more layered in time and in place um, than, than I had ever really thought was possible. So... Many thanks to the NEH and to you for that. Yes, because we had the readings and then we had that time for discussion in the mornings where we had a structure and a scaffolding to, uh, to think about guided questions together in response to the reading. And even like the, there was a discussion board. So I was like doing homework at night, typing up my, my thoughts in response to some of the, the readings. And I, I was just taking pages and pages of notes during our seminar conversations that made it into the made into my essay directly, but also like you said, Heather primed, like if you if you read um, is it Ro Rosenbaum's article about the mini Bishop's Miniature Museum, and then and then I'm in the archive looking at like this tiny postage stamp that, that Bishop put in one of her letters to, to Meth Vessel as like a little treat. And I'm like, oh, it's a miniature museum. Like you, you're just able to make all those connections so organically. Um, only it's not really organically, it's, it's we've, we've been set up for that. So yeah, I, I agree 100% with everything Heather just said. In looking the book over, I was struck by how interdisciplinary it was. I thought that was really enriching, just uh, the different directions that, and different fields that the essays spoke to and covered. There's also, I'll just say very quickly, you know, one of the first things I read in this archival trip was um, there was a, a thin folder of Frank Bedard's letters to Elizabeth Bishop. 
And in that folder was Frank's letter to her from Berkeley, California, um, describing to her, reading her poem in the waiting room, which was first published in the New Yorker, while sitting in a restaurant uh, aptly named the Hermit Hamburger. And he comments in that letter, you know, um, how odd it was to read a poem in the New Yorker, knowing that he would be thinking about that poem for the rest of his life, um, sort of in a fast food restaurant um, in, in California. And so it was wonderful to kind of start, I mean, that, that ended up actually being the lead off to my chapter, but it got me thinking about how, what we think of as Bishop's reception history um, predates us as, as, as critics, right? And as scholars, and that she was first received by, by her friends, by her peers, um, by younger poets who were interested and intrigued by her work. I felt almost from the very beginning that we were, we were kind of um, getting closer to, to how Bishop was immediately received and felt um, by those who knew her the best. Um, and, in, and in that way, I think the archive felt especially intimate um, as a scholar kind of participating in that long relationship with Bishop's work.